Hello and welcome to the world of Houdini. My name is Deborah Fowler. I want to go through a brief introduction of Houdini. Right now we're working in 20.5.278 and we're excited about the new release. However, if you're new to Houdini, there are some concepts I want to cover first. To start with, we're in a desktop called the Build. We're going to be looking at some of the other desktops, in particular Solaris, which is the new one to Houdini 18. Another popular one that you will probably use is the technical desktop. For now, I'm going to leave it in the default. Right here, you see a scene view, a network view, parameter view. Shelf tools are up here. I'm going to create a sphere using the shelf tool. So if I click on the sphere and hit enter, I get a sphere. Right now, I'm in the obj context. So Houdini has a concept of contexts. This will come into play later on. If I dive inside by double clicking, here I have the sphere node. This node is called a SOP node, or a surface operator, again re referencing the context that it is in. So once we have this, you'll notice that we can change the type, depending on our use. We can also change the parameters in here. So for example, if I wanted to change the radius, I can middle mouse click and I get the ladder control, and I can change in small increments or very large increments which makes it much easier to control. I can also revert to default. Now, if I wanted to play with this more, I could manipulate primitives and so on, just like you do in other 3D packages. However, what I want to focus on is procedural modeling. Let me show you some of the tools in Houdini that make that easier. Let's just start with a sphere and create a circle of spheres. I'm going to do this in multiple ways. It's really important to remember that there's many ways to do things in Houdini. Let me go ahead and create a copy to points node. I'm going to wire the sphere in, which if you float on these little round things, it says geometry to copy input one. This says target points to copy two. Okay, so if you're ever in doubt, you can always take a look at that, or you can click on this question mark and what that does is it goes to whatever node you've selected. You click on this, it will give you floating help. And in here, it will describe what that node does. So that can be a very handy reference. What we're going to do now is create a circle. And I'm going to wire this in. You can see my spheres are way too big. So I could either increase the circle or decrease the sphere. And you can see now I have a circle of spheres. If I wanted more, I would change the divisions on my circle. And I would go in here and change this. And you can see now I have a circle of spheres. But one of the things that is bothersome is I have to click over to here and click over to here to make changes, and that's kind of inconvenient, particularly if you were intending to make this into a tool. So what you can do is define your own parameters. Just like the sphere has a parameter to control the size, we can actually create top-level parameters because it's easier for us to grab them from one place on the top. Okay, so if you look at this particular node, see this gearbox? gear icon. If you click on that, so I just clicked on this, edit parameter interface. What this does is brings up an interface for creating your own parameters. So for example, if I bring up, say, a floating point, let's bring up a couple of floating points, I can then name these whatever I want. So for example, I could label this Kermit and call the parameter Kermit. So this is the label that I'll see in the window on my node. This is the actual parameter value. So if I hit apply, you can see I have Kermit. I have one that I haven't labeled yet. Kermit capital is my label. And the parameter when I float on here is called Kermit with a lowercase. Right now it doesn't do anything. I haven't set it up yet, but it is there. I can also go into the next tab and set a default value. So for example, let's do 0.5, apply. Now, if I go over here, and revert this to default, you can see that that's going to be the value that Kermit takes. If I hit accept, it will disappear the dialog box. And 
what you can do now is use this. So let's just copy that parameter. And again, I'm right clicking, dive inside, and I'm going to have this control the scale of this sphere. So paste relative reference. So if we go back up, now you can see that Kermit is actually controlling the sides of those spheres. And we can change the label for this to change the number of spheres and so on. What I'd like to move on to is other ways of creating this. So there are many ways to speak with Houdini. Houdini is multilingual. So for example, we could create this with HScript, with Vex, with Vops, with Python. Let's just go through a couple of examples and then we want to move on to the next step, which is lighting and rendering. And that's where we'll start talking about some of the newer features. So starting with a new file, I'm just going to hit tab to create a sphere. I could have created it from the shelf tool. Either one's fine. I'm going to dive inside to my geometry context and I'm going to bring down a copy node. Rather than copy to points, I'm going to bring down copy stamp. So you might say, wait, if I hit copy, I don't see copy with stamp. The reason is this node is on its way out. It's being deprecated because there are more efficient ways to do some of the variants that we do. We used to do with copy stamp with now for each. However, for historic purposes and for understanding, I feel that this is a good node to show. You'll also find it show up in other places. So how do you get it? Well, one way is to just bring up an HScript text port and say, op and hide, sop, copy. And what that will do, will bring back that node into your tab menu right there which was the original copy node. And what I'm going to do is create some HScript expressions. This is probably not the most popular way to do this. However, it's convenient to use this to show you some of the syntax for HScript. So if I turn off transform cumulative, I can type in expressions to put things exactly where I want them. You could think of the translate X value here, TX, as being assigned this expression, which I'm going to use the expression of a circle. So I'm going to create some radius, say five, times the cosine of some angle, which I'm going to say 10. And then I'm gonna multiply that by the number of copies that I have. Okay. I'm gonna copy that expression. I'm going to paste that expression in here and change this to sign. And I'm going to create 36 of these. And you will see when I click display that I have, much like I did in the other example, I have a circle of spheres. So again, this is another way to create that same thing. Let's just bring down a sphere again. And let's go ahead and create this using a point wrangle. So I'm going to create a point wrangle to supply the points that I'm going to use in a copy to points node. And in this case, I'm going to use this point wrangle to create those points. So right now I have none, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this from points to detail to give me geometry. And I'm going to create a loop. And for those of you who have taken C++, this will look familiar. And again, you don't have to do this. There's no reason you have to use code, but for those of you who like to use code, it's great. I'm going to create a X value, which is gonna be the radius times the cosine of the angle. Now in, in this one, it expects the angle to be in radians rather than degrees. So I'm going to do the same thing I was doing before, you now slightly different. And to save time, let me just copy and paste this. 
and then change this to Y, change this to sign. And we're actually going to create a point. That's why I changed this to details only, so I could create geometry. I'm going to set my location to be a vector. And I'm going to set that to X, Y, and 0. And I'm going to add a point, which is going to be GeoCell for 0, and then V at location. Okay, and that gives me my point wrangle node, and we have circle of spheres, but using a point wrinkle. Uh, let me just bring up the file so you can see some of the other methods. Um, this is the one we just went through. So just to give you an idea, there's my point wrangle node, same thing. Over here, you can see that I have some other iterations or examples. I have another way that I created it. In this case, I fed the points from a line into the point wrangle, and here, is iterating over all the points. It's important to remember that a point wrangle, when it's set to points or primitives or whatever it might be, my attribute wrangle is running over all of the points and it's creating this expression. So it can do that parallel. This is very efficient. So what I'm doing here is manipulating these point attributes. So that's another concept I want to introduce, which is attributes. Attributes are just data that's being stored. So for this particular line, if I go to the geometry spreadsheet, I can see that the line, which has 36 points, has got values, nothing in X, nothing in Z, but in Y, they're slowly increasing. And if I change this length, of course, this is going to change those values. If I change the number of points, I will also change the number of attributes that I'm seeing. So I have only 20 now. So let's go back to 36, and it doesn't really matter what our length is because we're changing that inside our point wrangle. So when we go to our point wrangle, what we're doing is changing the positions of those points. So it's running through, it's essentially doing an implicit loop through those points. Whereas when we were doing the detailed view, we were doing an explicit loop. All right, here we're just copying there onto that, and you can see there we have our circle of spheres. We can do the same thing with a pictorial view. So if you're not fond of code, you can actually do code blocks. So very much the same thing. If we look at this enlarged, you can see that I'm taking a point number and I'm multiplying by the angle increment. I'm taking my radius, which is my parameter, and I'm multiplying those by my values of cosine and sine. And then ultimately, I'm hitting P, by the way, too. Uh, bring up the parameters for whatever node I happen to click on. And you can see here what I'm doing is creating the cosine and sine, throwing that into a float to vector, and outputting that to my point. So this is similar for those of you coming from an Unreal background to Blueprint. It is a pictorial version of what I was doing with VEX. So VOPS is the pictorial version of VEX. And of course, I could also do that without having to feed in geometry. Uh, you can do a detailed only once. You can see here it's compiling that BOP network into code underneath the hood. And here's a more interesting view where I'm actually using a for each loop. And if you want more information on that, there's another video which talks about different copies that you can take a look at as well. So I just wanted to introduce those briefly so you can get an idea of the different languages that Houdini speaks, and also get an idea of how flexible Houdini is in that you can create things in many different ways. So before we move on to lighting and rendering, um, I want to talk a little bit about how to stay organized. So right now you're seeing some network boxes. Let me just get rid of those. Um, Relabeling your top level nodes is a good idea. You can lasso select and create network boxes. Uh, you can also create sticky nodes. One feature that they've added recently to the sticky note is if I type something in here, I can also right click on the outside of my sticky and set the text size. So for example, if I want it larger so that people aren't going to miss it, or if I'm doing a demonstration or something, I can make that so that it's really big. 
Uh, I can also create comments on a node, so I can edit comment, and in here, I can say this is my comment, whatever it might be. And then I can also click this, which will then display it. So sometimes you will see a little bubble there with no writing. It's because that hasn't been clicked. And you can always go in and edit your comment and change that. Okay, So that can be very handy. The other thing that's very popular to organize is to simply color your node. So you select a node and change its color to red, indicating that's a very important node or what have you. You can also uh, color coordinate certain nodes and have them coordinated with uh, sticky. So for example, I could change the sticky note in here to being red as well. Um, so those are all different ways of staying organized. To get that color palette up, I just hit C, it's a hotkey. C toggles on and off. All right, so another way to stay organized is to use USD. So USD is a way of creating and organizing your files for layout, lighting, and look development. And rendering. Okay, so moving on to look development and rendering, let's create a simple scene. I'm going to throw down a geo node, and inside this container, I'm going to create a sphere and a grid. Okay, so I have two objects. I'm going to merge them together, and I'm going to do something that we do standard, which is when we have two objects that are on top of each other, um, copying and paste that center so it sits on top of the grid. Okay, so now I have a sphere and a grid, and I want to render them with some kind of material. I'm going to start with just using a principal shader, which was developed for Mantra, just to start. Okay, so let's create a green color, and I'm going to go back into here, to the object section. I'm going to rename this, say, Demo, because Geo1 doesn't really mean much. And I'm going to go in here and create a material node. Now I can create a material node for each of the objects, or I could create groups. I'm going to create groups because it's a little bit cleaner. That way, if I need to change materials later on, I can just go straight to the material node and not have to worry about where things are in the network. All right, I'm going to call this group sphere. Or I could use another little trick that we use in Houdini, which is to use hscript and say dollar sign $OS, which then will, whatever we call this, you can see that right now we've got a group called group2. I can name this node grid group. And now my group name is going to be whatever the operator is. So in other words, that name of that node is going to be taken as the name of the group. Okay, so now how do I assign that material? Well, what I do is I grab the shader, and then I group that to the sphere. Then I add a shader for the grid group, which I'm going to just use the same shader and override one of the properties, which is going to be base color. And we'll set that to white. OK, so now I have materials assigned. Great. So what I want to do is add some lights. So I'm going to use standard mantra lights, uh, sky and sun. So that gives me a physical sun and sky. And ultimately, we're going to replace those eventually, but let's just start with this. And what else do we need? We need a camera. Okay, so new cam. Now, in order to move in the camera, we can either lock it and move around, or we can unlock it, move, and then say, oh, I like that camera. Keep that. Save view. And then, which camera? All right. So, those are quick tips. That gives us a camera, a couple lights, and a couple of objects. Let's go ahead and render it. So the first way, I could do Mantra. I'm not going to because we're moving away from Mantra. Let's do Karma. The easiest way to use Karma is to do a LopNet. And I'm going to grab this. And inside that LopNet, you'll notice now that I am in a Lop Network context. If I do a scene import, I'm just going to import all. You can see that immediately I've got a Karma render going on here in my viewport. So the options in here are Houdini a preview, or much like OpenGL, but Vulkan is the new improved version. Or we can do Karma CPU. We can also do Karma XPU. Karma XPU does not 
honor the material node as well as Karma CPU does. In fact, it's reported in documentation not to support it. You'll see that we don't get that material override. So basically, I'm going to use CPU for the moment. Now, when we use Karma proper, we can also just bring in our geometry and assign material X. That is another way. And then I can use Karma XPU, CPU interchangeably. Okay, so we have our nice little render, and we're happy. Another way that we could approach this is to use Redshift, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Now, what if we wanted to render this out to disk? Well, we need a Karma node or Render Properties node. We'll attach that, and then we hit this, Render to Disk. It's going to be going to wherever we specify, which if I save this file in my desktop, let's do New Folder Demo. And I'm just going to save that as untitled. And let's just go ahead and hit render to disk. You can see right now it's giving some warnings. It's saying camera one missing from input. So right now it's expecting camera one because in the render settings in here, in our camera settings, in our render settings, we have camera one. So what we want to do is just redirect that to cam one. Now, in Solaris, we will default to camera one. It's just the wording. Um, but now, let's go ahead and render this to disk. And we will get something computing. But where is it? So let's grab a file folder and go to our demo container. And you'll see that there's our hip file. There's our render folder. And inside is our untitled Karma Settings 0001 EXR. So let's bring that up with mplay. And you can see there's our nice little render. Okay. So why this name? That's because that's how it's titled in our render settings. So if you go to our output, you can see that the output picture is hip, render, hip name, operator, and frame padding. So here we have untitled, which is our hip name, render settings, which is Karma render settings. Right? That's the um, OS padding four with frame one, because we're on frame one. Okay. And that is our render right there. Okay, so we've just rendered successfully to disk. Later on, we're going to learn about how to render command line. Not right now. Um, we use a command called husk. We're moving away from hrender. In Redshift, uh, Redshift still uses hrender as its command line. So having a LopNet in your object context is a very easy way of creating a environment where you can quickly get a render out. So pretty straightforward. Now you could also use other methods of rendering Karma. It actually will live in the output context. Uh, that's less recommended. Or you could use Solaris. So just looking briefly at Solaris. Solaris is here. You can see again we're in a stage now. Nothing is in our scene. We still have all our objects in the SOP context but we're not seeing them in the stage context. And that's specific to Solaris. So let's go ahead and do in this LOP network, much like we did before, we're going to do a, let's do a scene import to keep it exact. So let's go ahead and do scene import, all. And then you can see that right now it's showing our Vulkan viewport. We can do Karma X CPU and we're back to where we were. If I look at the scene graph path, which is showing me the contents of my scene. You can see that in demo I have a mesh that has two different principal shaders assigned. I also have materials in here and a sun and a sky, as well as a camera. So it's successfully rendering. Again, if we wanted to write this out to disk, we would create a render properties node, which is what this is, and a USD ROP and then we could render this to disk. Okay, so here we are with our command settings. You'll notice that this is giving me a warning if you look at this. It says camera one is missing, and the reason for that is because in the Karma settings, it's referencing cam one, so we need to redirect that to cam one rather than using cam. And let's go to cam one so we can see what we're going to get. And then I'm going to do the exact same thing. I'll do it on frame two just so we have something different. And render to disk. And then we're going to bring up our file viewer again. And you can see there now we have our 
untitled render. We could have also launched and play from here, which it will go immediately to the directory that the hip file is in. And we can see that we have two renders in here, frame one and frame two. And they're identical because we're rendering exactly the same thing. What I want to do now is switch over to Redshift. So let's go ahead. For this one, I have to bring up a slightly older version of Houdini because I do not have Redshift installed for 20.5. Um, that was not available at the time of this recording. So I'm going to go ahead and bring up a 19.5 version so that I can show you Redshift. So we're working on the same scene in Redshift. Let's go ahead and get rid of the things we don't want to use, which is the lights. We want our objects and our camera. We'll need some materials. So let's go into our material context and grab an RS material builder. And then this we'll use, I like to use RS material rather than standard material. It's up to you. Let's try that again. There we go. RS material because it has some presets and that's always handy. I'm going to go ahead and choose a different color and go ahead with this. And in this case, rather than use overrides, I'm just going to do another shader, dive inside and change this for the moment. Okay, so now we're all set. Let's go back into our objects. We need to reassign those. You'll notice there's a warning saying the principal shader is not found. So we want to change this to our objects. And there's our grid and our sphere. Now I believe I made my second one. Let's actually make this this way. Go back in here and make this the white one. There we go. Now this it will ignore because that's not its override. So I'm just going to eliminate that. We now have our sphere and our grid assigned different materials. You won't see them in the viewport because this is a third party render. It doesn't show it to you. However, once we render it, Let's go ahead and render. So here's the render view. We hit play. It initiates render. And you can see that we have our render for Redshift. And we did not add any lights. Let's go into the Redshift tab and add some lights. I'm going to use a uh, environment light. So much like we had before, dome light. And also, I'm going to use an RS light. There is a sunlight. Um, I tend to use RS lights instead. I'm going to go ahead and tip it a little and then go in here and make it a distant light, change the intensity to 1, add just a subtle bit of color. So I'm just going to grab this and desaturate it. And then that gives it a little warmth. And then we have a, a sun, an environment, camera, and pretty much what we had before. And you can see now we have our render in Redshift. One of the things that I don't like about the dome it adds that background color, which I don't necessarily want. I'm going to get rid of that. So there is our Redshift render done. All right, if we wanted to write this to disk, again, um, we can do that. Uh, what we'll do is click this button here, go into our output tab. You can see there's already one there. But in here, I have my Redshift uh, IPR link to my render. And if I want to render to disk, I do this. It'll be looking for cam one. It does give you a preview, which is sometimes a little bit uh, unusual. I usually use a command line again when I'm working, but if you look in your file, you can see there's your untitled Redshift rock. And if I open up this with mplay, you will see that you're getting exactly what we just rendered, which is there. Okay, so that's a little bit about rendering in Houdini.